Okay, so what I want to do is I want to actually share with you uh, the program of work that I've been doing in India for the last 10 or 15 years with my uh, colleagues in this organization called Sangha, which I'll introduce you in a moment. And, and the work is really largely focused on overcoming barriers to accessing mental health care uh, in India. Uh, and for those of you who come later on the afternoon to hear a little bit more about uh, the biggest barrier of all, and that is to do with the shortage of human resources uh, for delivering mental health care. This is the sort of barrier that actually applies pretty much to all areas of healthcare delivery in India and indeed in most developing countries. Uh, and as you can see later on in my presentation, one of the innovations uh, that we have sought uh, to, uh, uh, to use to address this human resource barrier is by using lay people, ordinary folks. These are people with no health background at all. These are not nurses or doctors in the general sector, but these are just ordinary people uh, to impact the liver mental health care. And so I'll, I'll, be, I'll be demonstrating to you in much more detail uh, one such example of a program uh, that we developed and carried out in India uh, to improve the quality and access to care for people with depression and anxiety. But first, uh, I'm going to So how do you move the slides? This one. This one. Yeah. All right. So the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is Britain's national school of public health. Uh, uh, as you can see, the word uh, hygiene and tropical medicine reflects its history. The word global health did not exist more than 100 years ago. It's a pretty new word. Uh, uh, and probably just about 10 years old, and even when I uh, began my work at the school, the work global health did not exist, which is about 15 years ago. Uh, we have students like, like Duke does from around the world, faculty from around the world, uh, and it's, it's pretty much a very major uh, institution for, for, for tropical medicine and, and public health in the developing world. And it also has a very strong domestic agenda. Uh, so about half of all my colleagues uh, and half of all the work that we do, it has a strong European focus. SAMAC, on the other hand, is a relatively small organization with just about 100 uh, people working in this organization. It's a young organization, about 15 years uh, old. Uh, and as you can quickly see, there's a great imbalance here uh, between uh, the strengths of these two organizations in the partnership. Uh, the partnership was built around supporting the work that SAMAC does in three broad areas uh, of public health, child development, particularly early child development uh, and childhood disabilities. <laughs> Uh, the second area is adolescent health, primarily focusing on school-based uh, interventions for health promotion in young people. And the third area is mental health, which has been primarily the work that I've been doing uh, uh, over the last 15 years. Um, a brief history of this alliance. The alliance uh, started pretty much when Sanat was started. This is in part because I was one of the founders of this organization. Um, maybe later on in the discussion, we might uh, explore why uh, community-based non-governmental organizations function uh, really uh, as, as research organizations in India, and indeed they do the same sorts of roles in many other developing countries. Why is it, for example, that a very prominent academic institution like the London School uh, has an affiliation with a relatively small community-based NGO to carry out research. Uh, perhaps we can revisit that uh, in the discussion. The alliance has been built over 15 years, and a very important point here is that it's had uh, a, a strong continuing support from one very prominent British uh, medical research donor, the Wellcome Trust. Um, this may not be a, a donor that you're familiar with in the US, but I think the equivalent would be a foundation. Uh, an American foundation. The Wellcome Trust, though, operates, unlike a foundation, as a medical research uh, funding organization, so it is entirely built on investigator-led uh, applications as opposed to um, uh, programs that it itself directly funds and supports. Uh, the research that we have been carrying out together focuses on mental health problems across the life course, from early childhood, uh, conditions like autism, uh, through to mental health problems in adulthood, like depression, which is going to be the focus of the program I'll share with you later, uh, uh, and all the way through to dementia uh, in old age. Now, in the next few slides, I want to share with you some of the principles of the, of the Alliance. How do we actually work across all these different programs? There are some core principles that really lie at the heart of this collaboration uh, that's evolved over the last 15 years. The core mission of the work that we do is implementation work. 
So this is primarily around improving access to proven healthcare interventions that we know can improve the quality of life and well-being of people affected by mental health problems. So this is called a treatment gap. Does anyone have an idea what the word treatment gap might, uh, uh, might be uh, indicating? What does it actually mean? What, what, what does the word treatment gap suggest to you? A gap between the people that have a need to those that are actually treated. That's right, yes. So this is the absolutely correct. So there's a gap between the proportion of people in the population who have a healthcare need uh, and, and the number who actually have that need met. So do you have any idea on what the treatment gap might be in this country, in the US, uh, for people with common mental health problems like depression and anxiety? So, let me phrase that question slightly differently. Out of every 100 people in the US who have a depressive or anxiety disorder, what proportion have received treatments that we know will make them better in the previous year? Do you have any rough idea, guesstimate, of what the treatment gap might be? A guess? Yeah? Well, I think worldwide, I think it's about 23% receive effective treatment for depression. Okay, and in the US in particular? You'd expect to be more, right? Because worldwide would include like, Africa and Asia. So it would be about 50%. Uh, that is, but however, it has to be said, of that 50%, uh, those who don't receive treatment because they don't have access to treatment is actually much smaller. Group. There's a lot of people who may choose not to actually access treatment for a variety of reasons, for example, that they have chosen some other form of care outside the health sector. Um, in the developing world, if you look at the average of 23%, I'm not sure if that is the average, but it would probably be a, probably be a, a fairly accurate number, I think. Um, it would, the number of people who would receive care would be 1 in 10. In other words, the treatment gap would be about 90%. Now, if we were to take a serious mental illness, one which perhaps in this country would be more likely to access care, say a condition like, any, any thoughts of what you might consider as a serious mental illness? Yeah? Yeah, so schizophrenia would be a good example of a very serious mental illness. It's a much rarer condition, of course, than depression, uh, but it's a far more disabling and serious one. It's also one that most people will recognize uh, much more quickly than in depression. Do you have a sense of whether the treatment gap for a serious condition would be lesser than for a common mental health condition like depression? In other words, would more people with schizophrenia access care than with depression, proportionately? Yes, I think they would. So the treatment gaps for schizophrenia would be smaller because it is a more serious condition and therefore more evident um, and for where biomedical care would be sought much more, much more quickly. But even for schizophrenia, the treatment gap in some parts of, say, rural India, rural Africa will approach 90%. That is to say, 9 out of 10 people with schizophrenia receive no care at all. The same would apply, in fact, for conditions like epilepsy. So, the core mission of our alliance has been to work out ways in which these conditions for which we know there are proven treatments uh, can be accessible to the majority of people with those conditions. Now there are four principles that we follow in the, 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 the process of carrying out this research. The first is a very systematic methodology uh, that we adopt for every condition. That methodology typically begins by first of all understanding everything that we know about that condition in that local context. So this involves carrying out reviews of literature uh, and carrying out often uh, a primary ethnographic research to better understand how local communities uh, uh, describe this problem, how they actually historically have dealt with this problem, what are the labels they use for this problem, how they understand the causal uh, 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 models for this problem and so on. Because typically, as you know, uh, people uh, in developing countries do not understand many mental health problems in the same way as biomedicine understands them. Uh, and so therefore, we really do need to understand the language uh, and the explanatory models in order to form, uh, 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 to improve access to care. This would be a very important first step. We then go on to do basic epidemiology. This is to say describing the burden of these uh, problems, simple prevalence estimations, uh, more complex analytical studies to look at who suffers these problems. So in other words, to define risk factors and risk groups, and to further define help-seeking patterns. Where do people go for these problems? Uh, what kind of care do they currently receive? Where are the gaps in the care? But also, where are the opportunities uh, in actually strengthening health systems? Uh, in order to address their unmet mental health care needs. We then start uh, looking at how we can deliver the proven treatments 
uh, within the existing healthcare system, but using power shifting as our primary uh, intervention. What do you think task shifting is? What does it mean to you the word task shifting? It's when you uh, push down some of the essential health resources to like lay people to, to relieve the more specialist resources. That's right. And why do we adopt task shifting? What is the rationale within health systems to champion task shifting? You typically have limited specialist resources, so you really want to localize and make, make those essential health resources more accessible. That's right. It's, it's, it's a strategy to try and rationalize the use of the available human resources uh, in health, health systems. And typically, the idea of task shifting arose because of the shortage of specialists to deliver healthcare tasks. So the idea was, who else is available in the health system who can deliver these tasks? Any examples that you can think of about from mental health care, good examples of task shifting in, in, in global health or public health? Any examples that you can think of? Maybe in this country of task shifting? One example, yeah. I was going to say, even within primary care, we have shifted from the primary care physician providing a lot of the services to nurses providing a lot exactly. of services yes. and other That's right. paramedical. So one example that is almost universal is, 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 is safe motherhood. Uh, you know, so the shifting of tasks from physicians to midwives is one example. From midwives to traditional birth attendants is yet another example. Depending on which health system you're in, task shifting operates uh, according to what human resources you have available to you. But task shifting occurs in all health systems. Uh, the only difference is what you shift and to whom. And that will be contextually determined. Um, in fact, I would suggest to you that task shifting is not only about using specialists in a, in, a, in a more efficient manner, but it's also about improving the um, acceptability of care. Because for many people, actually, uh, acceptability of care often involves care closer to your own home, often involves accessing people who may be more familiar to you uh, than people in big buildings in the cities. So it's not only about reducing, uh, uh, making healthcare more efficient, but also about improving acceptability, and finally about reducing costs. And this is a huge issue in this country as much as in any other part of the world, the incredible costs associated with specialist care. If one can deliver the same quality care using less expensive human resources, then obviously there's an economic uh, imperative as well. So what we then do is to then carry out research that looks at how can we deliver mental health care interventions using non-specialists and even lay people. And this requires a very systematic set of research endeavors, uh, formative and pilot studies, that can ensure that these interventions can be delivered safely. That's our first and most important uh, uh, concern, is the safety uh, of the delivery system. And then, once we've done that, we might then carry out randomized control trials uh, to examine the efficacy and the effectiveness. That is to say, once you've actually got a safe method of delivery that's acceptable uh, to people with these problems, uh, now we want to evaluate uh, to what extent does this model produce benefits uh, in health outcomes. So that's the first principle, a very systematic process. And in the example I'm going to give you of depression and anxiety, this process took us roughly about 12 years to get to the final step. Uh, so that may not, that may, well, depending on your perspective, that may or may not seem like a very long period of time, but it is essential for us to actually follow the systematic process if we are to arrive at the end of this process with an intervention that is potentially scalable, that is to say, that is likely to make impact at the level of the health system at scale. The second very important principle is the idea that mental health care needs to be integrated within routine health care systems. That is to say, not developing a parallel or separate or vertical silo in which mental health care is delivered, but actually integrating it with, as far as possible, with the existing health care system. Um, also, to look at what other health priorities exist in that health care system and identify points of where you can actually converge mental health care into those priorities. A very good example at the moment in India, anyway, is chronic diseases. This is uh, conditions like heart disease or diabetes. Um, there are great similarities in the way healthcare systems need to respond to chronic diseases uh, with mental health care. And so this offers you a very useful opportunity uh, to ask for piggyback mental health care on the chronic disease programs or vice versa. And finally, uh, there's a strong equity focus in our work, uh, so focusing primarily on vulnerable populations, populations of people 
who may either be at greater risk of suffering mental health problems, for example, people with HIV, uh, or who may have uh, uh, inequitable access to mental health care, for example, the very poor or, or certain demographic groups uh, uh, such as women. The third, as with any alliance between a northern partner with great uh, uh, resources at its disposal, such as a London school, uh, and a much smaller partner in a developing country like Sangha, there's a great deal of importance to be placed on ensuring there is equitable opportunities for capacity building. That is to say, more opportunities for people in the developing country partner organization, because uh, that starts off at a much weaker level uh, than, than, than the northern partner does. And a lot of the emphasis has been to build the institutional capacity of, uh, of Sangha to become an effective research partner. For example, things like building institution, institutional review boards, uh, creating strong research governance systems, including all the way through the financial management system. These are all systems that need to be in place if the partner in the developing country is going to be, uh, at some point in time, an equal partner uh, with the one in the north. And of course, uh, investing heavily in individual capacity building. And again, this would be fairly standard for you, uh, uh, providing a range of different opportunities from degrees all the way through to mentoring uh, individual researchers to ultimately become uh, independent investigators. And the fourth principle, and this is extremely important for all health systems research, our ultimate goal is not simply to publish our findings in journals, but to be actively conscious that nobody in policy reads journals. Uh, and therefore being aware that we have to actually take our findings to people in the formats that they are familiar with and comfortable with. Uh, this involves um, a range of different dissemination uh, 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 opportunities, building capacity with other groups of people who might potentially find the methods that we've evolved and developed of, 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 of relevance to their own work, um, strong partnerships with government, this is extremely important. All our work is done with government, it's done within government healthcare settings. So in that context, we're actually testing these interventions within routine healthcare settings right from the start. And active engagement with civil society groups. What kind of groups do you think would be very important in civil society uh, when we are trying to disseminate uh, work in the mental health field? What kind of groups do you think would be very important for us to, to be working with? <coughs> Um, religious institutions? I'm sorry. Religious institutions? Okay, so faith-based organizations, yes, because they provide a lot of pastoral and other forms of, uh, of interventions for people in distress. Which other groups? Are you talking about their health, healthcare workers' unions? Yes, how can you, yeah, they, they would be a very important group, but I'd probably put them within the same uh, group as a professional. Uh, 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 organizations with whom we want to network with, whether they're, they're medical or other health worker organizations. I have to say there are actually no unions. Uh, having said that, I don't think there is any union that I'm familiar with uh, of, of um, there is of doctors, of course, professional societies representing physicians, uh, but I don't know if there is any for community health workers. Any other civil society groups that are very important in the mental health world, very important in this country as well? In this country, we have family of mental yeah, health. Yeah, absolutely. It's people who are directly affected by mental health. So they form a very important advocacy group. Uh, they often have, they're voters as well, don't forget. Uh, and I think uh, working directly with user groups, they're called sometimes user groups or, 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 or survivor groups, uh, depending on where you are and what context you're in. Uh, but nevertheless, these are groups of people who are either directly affected or caregivers of people who are directly affected by mental illness. This is a very important constituency uh, with whom we will engage. Okay, I'm now going to talk to you uh, more specifically about the MANUS program, but I'm going to take a pause here first and ask if there are any questions about this alliance. This was just by way of giving you a background uh, that will make this particular program from where you know, more, more understandable. This program is a specific program that we have only recently completed, uh, and the background was really to give you an introduction to the platform uh, from where this program was carried out. Are there any questions so far uh, about this research platform that I have introduced? I have one. Um, with the ongoing privatization of the health sector in India um, and it be representing a larger portion of health services, just wondering how does your model fit with that? Do you tend to align more with the public services and the, the government sector or do you really try to integrate as well with private services? I think that's a great question. As you will see in this program, we actually work both with the government and the private sector. And I think you're right. The private sector plays an increasingly important role in healthcare delivery in India. Uh, and, uh, and 
But for some reason, <coughs> there are many reasons actually, um, the private sector has been treated as being outside the healthcare delivery sector by the government. It's always been seen as being separate from. So therefore, no public health initiative has actually involved the private sector until quite recently. Uh, the recognition that private healthcare providers are important players in the health system is fairly recent. In recognizing that, our program actually did include the private sector, but as you will see, we had very different results in the private and public sectors. Uh, uh, the results were very divergent, uh, and I'll return to that later. Okay. With task shifting, is there, are there any adverse effects on the community or something that you didn't intend to happen? There could be. There absolutely could be. And I think one has to therefore do the very systematic development work before one does any evaluations of effectiveness. And I think that that stage of developing the intervention uh, is a critically important one to identify possible places where safety might be compromised or, or the dangers that you hadn't anticipated might occur. So yes, and also of course within any trial, you're constantly uh, uh, um, looking out for serious adverse events as well as you do with any trial. So the, the, the short answer though is whether we found any adverse events uh, with our program. As you'll see in a moment, or there weren't any. Um, I have a question about tax shifting in general. Um, there have been efforts like to try to help her in mental, care, mental health. There have been others uh, looking at super specialty care. There's, there's cardiologists who've tried to train yeah. uh, or OT nurses to do things that we otherwise thought only cardiac surgeons could do. Um, the, from a policy perspective, the, there's also some resistance that you often face from professional groups. In this case, could be from psychiatrists, could be from other mental health care providers. How does one think about addressing that even before we get to uh, demonstrating efficacy and effectiveness of the intervention? Now, I think that's a really good question, Manoj. I, I have to say, I've never done that. Uh, I, I, I think, but, but I should be doing that. We should all be doing that, bringing the professional groups on board. Mm -hmm. The problem with bringing professional groups on board is that that's an uncertain process in terms of how long it's going to take. Uh, and another problem is that professional groups' usual first argument is going to be, this is not safe. Right. So the question is, are we putting the cart before the horse, as it were, by trying to get professional groups on board before we have the evidence? Mm -hmm. um, so my strategy has been to first demonstrate that it's safe, yeah. first, because that's the first argument professional groups have, this is not a safe idea. Uh, then to demonstrate that it's effective, mm -hmm. and then to try and bring the professional groups on board. Uh, the same could be said about traditional birth attendants. Mm -hmm. I don't think obstetricians would have historically accepted mm -hmm. TBAs unless you could dem until you could demonstrate that they were actually uh, a, a safe option. The same applies for HIV AIDS care right. uh, and so on. So I think the role of researchers is to identify the question, to, to identify the justification, the rationale for that question from a public health point of view, to ensure the safety of the participants uh, and then to carry out the study demonstrate that it is in fact safe and effective and then do the advocacy with the professional groups. Mm -hmm. Even then, I will tell you the professional groups do not. <coughs> no, they don't, they're not comfortable with this kind of evidence. In part because it also suggests, mistakenly, that you do not need to be trained to deliver mental health care or obstetric care. That's not the point. Task shifting is not creating a cheap psychiatrist. Task shifting is not creating a cheap HIV doctor. Task shifting is simply training someone to deliver a specific task. Another very important point is that task shifting can only operate if there is supervision. I'll come to that later on. Task shifting is not task dumping. Okay, a lot of people mistake task shifting to be task dumping. Task dumping means, well, we're just going to give all this work off to the community health worker and not worry about them any, uh, this, this issue anymore. Task shifting is not, task, it's not task dumping. It will only work if there is strong supervisory and support systems in place, and that supervisory and support system includes a clear referral pathway for those individuals who actually do not respond to the day health work or community health work intervention. And there will always be some individuals, as you will see in a moment, who do need to be seen by the specialist. What task shifting does is it acts as a gatekeeper, almost. So it provides care to a much larger chunk of the population by using low-cost human resources but the low-cost human resources also provide a gatekeeper so that those who need to see a specialist are truly serious, seriously ill and actually are the kinds of individuals who specialists are trained uh, to provide care. So it's about getting efficiency. 
Okay, let me now let me now uh, uh, turn to this example uh, of task shifting and uh, that, that that we've just recently completed, and I'll, I'll explain to you some of these words as as we go along uh, in, in the presentation. So first of all, I want to tell you what the target group was for uh, this this intervention, the Manus intervention. Manus, uh, the word Manus, which is the name of the program, it uh, it's it's an acronym uh, derived from it, a local language word, uh, the local language of the place where this was carried out, which is in Goa, is Konkani, uh, and the MANAS stands for, it's an acronym in the Konkani language, which stands for a project to promote mental health. Um, but it also is a word in the local language as a whole, which means humanity. Common mental disorders are a public health term to describe a group of emotional conditions that are characterized by the diagnosis of either depression, anxiety disorders, and somatoform disorders. Somatoform disorders are disorders in which you have physical, prominent physical uh, uh, complaints uh, with, uh, with no obvious physical cause. Now, I want to ask you how you think these sorts of conditions present in routine primary healthcare settings. What is your impression if I told you that a substantial number of people in routine primary health in Africa and Asia have a common mental disorder, what would you expect to see in such a person with that diagnosis? What kind of reason do you think they'll be coming to the primary health care facility with? They probably can't sleep. So. Yeah, okay, so sleep problems is one of the most common reasons why people will come to their doctor or their nurse. Uh, and the most likely diagnosis would be a common mental disorder, okay? What other? What other here? Yeah. Fatigue or malaise. Absolutely. So fatigue, malaise, feeling tired, sleep problems. Hallmark classic features of common mental disorders. Losing <coughs> appetite. Okay, so changes in appetite, losing appetite most typically, but sometimes increased appetite. Yeah. What have you noticed with these three presentations? Change in appetite, change in sleep, and fatigue. What, what, what are the characteristics of these three presentations? They're all physical. I'm sorry? They're all physical. They're all physical, absolutely. Yeah. So the most important thing to remember about common mental disorders is they do not present with mental symptoms. Okay? It's, it's, it's one of the greatest barriers in the, in the recognition of these problems in primary care is that they are classified under the broad rubric of mental health problems, but the person who's coming to the primary care facility is not actually complaining of a mental health symptom. They're complaining of physical symptoms. Any other examples of physical symptoms that anyone who's ever been to a primary care facility in a developing country, even probably in this country as well, what are the commonest things that people go to the doctors with? Headaches. Headache. Okay, so headaches, other form, other aches and pains around the body. What else? Palpitations, dizziness, and so on and so forth. All of these physical symptoms are in fact primarily due to depression or anxiety. Of course, in some cases, if you begin to explore in particular people's emotional symptoms, it is not difficult then to elicit the core psychopathology of these conditions. Typically, the loss of pleasure and loss of interest in the activities that once you found interesting or enjoyable. Um, in India, and certainly in the population that we worked in Goa, uh, there is this particular symptom of tension. I put that in apostrophe because obviously tension is an English word, but it has actually been transferred into the local language and has become a way of explaining uh, to, to someone that I'm under a lot of stress. Okay, the, I think the closest equivalent in the English language would be stress. If you ask people, yes, you can elicit low mood, uh, but more commonly you elicit irritability, that is to lose your temper more easily than you used to, uh, and very typically you will often have uh, a, a number of impairments in your daily life. You are unable to carry out uh, activities in your daily life, in work, in school, in domestic and social activities. So a very important point to take home from this is that by far the commonest reason people will be presenting in primary healthcare settings will be not because of emotional symptoms, but because of physical symptoms. However, when you ask people questions to do with their emotional symptoms, it is usually quite easy and commonplace to find that those symptoms are being experienced. 
Now, this is a rather complex slide, but this is simply to show you, and part of the slide has disappeared, uh, but this is simply to show you that the etiology, that is to say the cause of depression and anxiety, is a complex interaction between genetic and environmental factors. And this is typically true of most chronic conditions. If I had to make a slide on the etiology of diabetes, it would actually look a lot like this. Um, it's typically an interaction between your, your, your biological vulnerabilities that you've typically inherited, um, vulnerabilities that you've acquired in early childhood, in early life, for example, deprivation in early life, and your personality, and then more serious life events that you've experienced recently that then led to the final emergence of, uh, of, of the disorder. So for example, the case of depression and anxiety, by far the common, do you know, what do you think the commonest life events are in people's lives that trigger episodes of depression or anxiety? What sorts of life events do you think? Um, loss of life, or loss of life of a loved one. Yeah, so bereavement. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, lo loss of someone you love. Yeah. It's usually a range of different losses. That's probably one of the best examples. What other kinds of life events? Ah, uh, diagnosis with a serious health problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so suffering from a serious chronic medical problem. Can you think of an example? Like HIV. Yeah, okay. HIV, cancer, mm -hmm. any, any, any serious medical problem. Yeah. What, what other life events? Unemployment, just not being Yeah, loss of a job. So that's another kind of a loss. Losing your job, lo losing uh, uh, and being chronically unemployed, yeah. Yeah, that's another very important example, something pretty serious, life threatening. Mm -hmm. So in India and in most developing countries, do you know which of the two genders, in fact this is true of all parts of the world, which of the two genders is more vulnerable to suffer depression and anxiety? Yeah? Yeah, by, by a ratio of about two is to one, uh, so uh, almost a double of the risk. Now, what is it about women's social world that might make them more vulnerable to, to suffer from depression and anxiety? Yeah? They typically have a more support level, so uh, they may have access to education, but then they don't have access to the same levels of employment. So that's right. Space. So it's gender disadvantage, yeah? Mm -hmm. And in what's interpersonal worlds, how does gender disadvantage express itself? What, what are the various ways in one's... So this is a structural uh, uh, factor, isn't it? That all women in society, irrespective of their educational level, often are disadvantaged by the fact that they're women. But at the interpersonal level, what are the triggers that... Yeah? Uh, well, they may be more vulnerable to Absolutely. So violence is by far one of the most important predictors of depression and suicide in women. Uh, and of course, gender disadvantage that you described provides a structural framework in which you understand uh, one, one, of the, one of the very important structural frameworks of understanding violence. So that's another example of a, uh, of a sort of a trigger, an acute trigger that can precipitate depression. So common mental disorders are a public health priority for a number of reasons. First of all, they're very common. Uh, that's the word, uh, the, the word itself uh, implies that. Anywhere from 10 to 20% of all adults coming to primary health care centers in Africa, Asia, would have a common mental disorder. That doesn't mean they don't also have a physical health problem, by the way. In fact, a substantial number of these individuals will have both a mental health and a physical health problem. Um, these are very important causes of disability. In fact, depression is in the top three causes of disability globally. Uh, and in certain age groups, for example, in young adults, it is the leading cause of disability uh, in that age group. Uh, it's also associated with very high suicide rates. And I think it's important to remember that suicide in many developing countries is in fact one of the leading causes of death in young people. Uh, this is something that's less well recognized in the global health context. Uh, and depression is a very important, it's not the only factor, but it is a very important factor that explains those high rates of suicide. It has profound effects on families. So, for example, if a mother is depressed, uh, her newborn child is more likely to have uh, adverse consequences, such as, for example, the child may fail to thrive, may be underweight, stunted, uh, may not have all their uh, immunization completed, and so on. And there's a whole range of other health complications. In other words, if depression coexists with another health problem, then the outcome of that health problem is sometimes worse. The best example of that is heart disease, non-communicable diseases. If you have a heart attack 
and you also become depressed after the heart attack, you are two to three times more likely to die in the year after your heart attack than if you do not become depressed. So there is something about the co-occurrence of depression with a serious medical problem that makes the medical problem outcome a lot worse. Okay? So, for all these reasons, this is a major public health priority globally, and certainly this is also true for developing countries. Now, as you remember, I showed you right at the beginning that in order to get to the stage where we want to start evaluating task shifting interventions, we have to do a whole lot of preliminary work, and we've been working in the field of common disorders for nearly a decade before we actually uh, uh, launched the MANUS program. And these are some of the examples of the major findings that, we, uh, that emerged from that decade of work. Uh, we found that, for example, we could reliably detect common mental disorders using simple screening questionnaires in clinics. We found that most people with mental <coughs> problems had no biomedical uh, uh, explanation for their, their health problem. Typically, they use stress models. Uh, and again, I think this might be just as true uh, for people in, in most other parts of the world. The prevalence was quite high in the Gohan context that we were working in. Not, uh, as I've already mentioned, the most common complaints were somatic. In women, gynecological complaints were very important. Uh, for example, low pelvic pain. And, and South Asia, in particular, the complaint of vaginal discharge, which for historic reasons has always been misunderstood as a, uh, a complaint associated with infection. But in fact, these are not infections. These are, uh, these are actually these are no, this is a normal discharge that is actually being misinterpreted uh, because the woman is anxious or depressed. Uh, much of this disorder was being missed. That is to say, the person would come to the health center with fatigue and would, instead of having a proper diagnostic assessment done, they would receive multiple consultations or lots, all kinds of blood tests for all kinds of diseases that are associated with fatigue, most of which are pointless, uh, multiple consultations because the person would not get better, uh, and they would not receive evidence-based treatments, but instead what they would receive is usually a cocktail of medicines. So for example, do you know what the commonest medicine might be in India today? What is the commonest prescription? What kind of class of medications are most commonly prescribed in primary health care in Asia? Yeah? Uh, no, much common than antibiotics, another class. Even common. See, because are common, antibiotics are common, but even commoner in Asia in general. A kind of steroid. Yeah, that's also pretty common. <laughs> the reason you're not guessing it is because these are not considered medicines in, in, in America, maybe. Vitamins? Vitamins, yeah. yeah. <laughs> are they considered medicines here? Yeah. No, I don't think they are. So nutritional supplements and vitamins are, are by far the single commonest prescription category in India and in China, in most parts of the world. And these are being given as a folk medicine to treat fatigue. So the person comes in with tiredness, they get a vitamin. Uh, there's no, of course, there's no link between the two. Uh, but nevertheless, you get vitamins, and vitamins, of course, are not free. Uh, these are actually purchased, you have to purchase them, because they are amongst the few drugs that are actually not considered medicines at all by the health system, because they're not. Um, but they're very frequently used. Another common prescription is a sleeping pill for sleep, and a headache pill for headaches, and so on. So as you can see, the person gets a whole bunch of pills for different symptoms, but not the primary, uh, not the primary one. Now this, the consequence of that is that these conditions have enormous financial implications. So one study that we did many years ago now was to compare the economic consequences of um, three very common health problems affecting women. Uh, we compared anemia, which is a nutritional disorder uh, uh, due to iron deficiency, with reproductive tract infections uh, and depression in women in a large community setting in, 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 in Goa, and showed that of these three conditions, there was only depression that was associated with catastrophic health expenditure. That is to say, very large health expenditure that threatened the livelihoods of the family. And the reason for that very high expenditure is self-evident. It's because these women will be asked to purchase all sorts of medications, do all sorts of tests, and do all sorts of other secondary investigations in order to work out what their problem was, rather than just simply an exploration of their mental health and provision of treatment for depression. So this is a very important consequence of the lack of appropriate care. Now there are many barriers to providing this care with the primary health centers. Um, these are just some of the barriers that we encountered when we did some of our formative work of trying to develop a task shifting intervention. So a very common one is that you know primary care workers don't see this as a medical problem. 
they, they, they see this as just part of the miserable life that many poor people lead uh, in, in that community. So they're not about, they feel uncomfortable about medicalizing what they see as just the everyday misery of living in poverty. Uh, there's also the issue of somatic physical presentations. People don't think of the mental health uh, 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 cause of the physical uh, 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 presentation. The stigma, many people don't want their depression to be called a mental health problem because for them, mental health means schizophrenia, it means something really serious, it means landing up in an asylum. So this is not something that actually even the person with the problem would want to have a label uh, attached to them. There's a problem of the lack of availability of treatments in primary health care, uh, and very importantly, the, the lack of skills and the lack of time of the existing primary health care workers to actually deliver these treatments. Now, when we started this program, if you remember, I mentioned to you it's very important for us to know what the landscape of this work is from a global context. And when we did that, we discovered that these challenges of delivering depression care in India were not unique to India. In fact, they have been experienced in rich countries uh, for decades before that. And people in countries like the US and the Western Europe had begun to think of task shifting much before we had. This is ironic, isn't it? Because this part of the world has so many more mental health care professionals uh, than, than the developing world. But even in this part of the world, in order to improve access and reduce cost of care, people have started developing task shifting models. And a key element, as I mentioned earlier, this is not task dumping, it's task shifting, is the idea of collaboration. So the idea of collaboration is that you redefine the role of different people in the health team so that each person has a very specified role according to their skill set. In a collaborative care model, many of the psychosocial treatments are delivered by the least trained, the lowest cost, frontline health worker, and the specialist provides supervision, support, and referral pathways. When you evaluate such collaborative care, you find that three ingredients play a key role in ensuring that the model of care works, the systematic identification of patients, the level of skills of the non-specialist worker, and the availability of supervision. Now, this is an important model that applies across all chronic conditions. This is not a depression model. This is equally true for care of cancer, of, uh, of, of hypertension, of diabetes, of schizophrenia, any chronic condition. This is the platform of care that provides most efficient evidence-based care uh, uh, across all these conditions. So this is the model that we chose because Global Evidence showed us uh, this is the model that's likely to produce the, most, uh, the, the best results at the lowest cost. So we set up a trial to compare two different models of care, a collaborative step care model with usual care in primary health centers run both in the private and the public sectors in the state of Goa uh, in, in, on the west coast of India. Now, I, I, I'm aware that many of you here may not be familiar with study design, so I'm just going to briefly tell you what this was. We did a randomized control trial, which is to say we took health facilities and we randomly allocated them to either be receiving our active experimental intervention, which is the collaborative step care intervention, uh, and half, so half of them went into the active arm and the other half went into a control or comparison group. But the comparison group also receives something for ethical reasons, uh, which I'll show you in a moment. This is called a randomized control trial, and the word cluster, the word cluster signifies that we were randomizing not individuals, but an entire facility, because the intervention was a facility-based intervention. So everyone in a facility received the same kind of care. So that's why it's called a cluster randomized trial. And I think to follow up from your comment earlier on, uh, we, we tried this intervention out separately in the public sector and in the private sector because we believe that maybe the effect of the intervention may be different according to its sector you're in. In the usual care, which we call enhanced for these reasons, we diagnose mental disorder using a simple screening questionnaire. If you, if you remember a few slides ago, I said that the evidence showed that systematic, proactive case finding was a very important part of the effective uh, collaborative care model. So we use a brief tool. You need not know what this stands for. It's just a 12-item questionnaire that measures depression and anxiety symptoms and generates a score. It takes a couple of minutes to administer, so it can be done in very busy healthcare settings. And if you're literate, you can complete the questionnaire yourself, so it doesn't even require any help worker time. 
These results were then communicated to the doctor, uh, and the doctors have provided guidelines on how to treat depression with antidepressants if the person had severe depression. So this is what we did in usual care. It's enhanced because none of this was available before the trial. So even the comparison to the sister got more than what they normally got before the trial began. However, in the collaborative step care arm, we added two new human resources. This was the big new investment. The first is a lay person who was trained. Uh, this is a, a woman from the local community who had no previous health background. Some of them were graduates, but many of them were not. In other words, they'd only completed school, high school. We trained them over six weeks to provide a suite of non-pharmacological interventions, so the whole range of psychological and social interventions that we know can help people with depression recover. And a part-time visiting psychiatrist who visited once a month in the primary health center to provide supervision, support, and to see those individuals together with the lay health worker who had very serious problems, was not, were not responding uh, to what the lay health worker was delivering. This is the step care intervention. Now, this is another important word, which I think is quite useful for you to understand uh, from a health system's perspective. And this is an idea that not everyone needs every intervention. And it's typically uh, a platform for all chronic diseases. The idea behind step care is that you give the lowest cost intervention to everyone, and then you ration out the more intensive interventions according to need. So let me give you an example from diabetes that perhaps more of you may be familiar with than depression. What do you think is the one intervention that everybody with diabetes, no matter how serious or, 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 or not it might be, should be in, uh, putting into place? Sorry? All right, and there were a lot of murmurs. <laughs> Somebody loudly. Diet. Diet, absolutely. It costs nothing. It's, something, it's about changing the way you eat. Uh, and that's not a medical intervention, it's a lifestyle intervention. It costs nothing at all, and no matter how serious your diabetes is, everybody should be modifying their diet. Is there any other lifestyle intervention for diabetes? Exercise. Exercise, okay. So, this is an example of the first step of intervention for everyone with diabetes. It costs nothing, it doesn't require a doctor to deliver. You can deliver this through a non-specialist worker who has reasonably good information about the kinds of diets and the kinds of exercise somebody with diabetes should institute. If you have more severe diabetes or exercise and diet is not sufficient for you to manage your diabetes, what is the next line of help that a, uh, the medical system can offer, the healthcare system can offer? What comes after exercise and diet? Does anyone know? It's, it's more medical. Now we're reaching the medical realm, but still, let me see if anyone has any idea what comes after. Yeah? Are you trying to diagnose type 1 or type 2? Maybe? Yeah, okay, so you diagnose type 2. Well, actually, this is specifically type 2 diagnosis. Type 1 is slightly different. So this is adult diabetes. You take pills, yeah, medic medication. If medication is not sufficient, what do you do next? You take injectable insulin. Okay. If injectable insulin is not good enough, then you might need to see a very complex, diabe you know, a really specialized diabetes care management. So can you see there's a, there's a set of steps. You don't rush straight to insulin on, at the very first step, uh, unless the person has extremely severe uncontrolled diabetes. The idea behind step care is that you rationalize these interventions according to the needs of the individual. And the same way for depression. The first step is psychoeducation, which is similar to lifestyle, a lifestyle change. Uh, in, in diabetes, is providing information about healthy living, about the condition, about uh, exercise, which is also, interestingly enough, a very powerful antidepressant intervention. Um, in the next step, uh, you provide either antidepressants or a psychotherapy. In the third step, if people don't respond, you give both. And in the final step, you refer to the psychiatrist. So this is the idea of step care, which the lay health counselor was managing for the individuals in her clinics. So how did this particular intervention overcome the barriers I, I, I mentioned to you earlier? And mind you, many of these barriers apply to all chronic disease care. The first, the low recognition of depression anxiety. Well, we overcame that by doing routine screening. So everyone was waiting to see the doctor. We just handed out these questions to them. It's a bit like doing routine screening by doing a finger prick of blood for blood sugar. This would be the equivalent. We don't have a finger prick blood test for depression yet. So that's why we would ask people questions. So you do a screening questionnaire. That way, you overcome the barrier of low diagnosis. 
The stigma of mental disorder was overcome by avoiding the use of psychiatric diagnostic labels and using the language that we had through earlier research identified as being the language of emotional distress that people locally found comfortable. Uh, so we used their words and their language rather than biomedical labels which could alienate people. The lack of human resources uh, by introducing, of course, the low-cost uh, uh, new lay health worker in the clinic, uh, providing a range of treatments through collaborative care as a team. Uh, so these are the different ways in which we overcame uh, uh, the barriers that, uh, that uh, I mentioned to you earlier, uh, really standing the way to the integration of mental health care in routine care settings. Now, these pictures just show you the, the trial in operation. Um, and, and this picture here on the top left-hand corner is a very important one because it really shows star shifting in, in, in progress. This lady here is a lay health counselor. So she was recruited from the local uh, community. And this is a primary health center clinical. And this lady here is a visiting specialist. She happens to be a psychiatrist. Uh, and what they're doing is their monthly supervision meeting, uh, at which time the, the, the psychiatrist will be reviewing case notes, looking at uh, personal issues that the lay health counselor might be facing, um, and, 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 and occasionally seeing patients together. Now try and think of how this is an efficiency model. This lady here, the psychiatrist, by virtue of visiting the clinic once a month, can visit 20 clinics a month, assuming she works 20 working days a month. Each clinic has a catchment area of about 100,000 people. So you can quickly see how one primary health, one uh, specialist can actually cover a much larger population than she would have been able to cover if there was no down shifting in place. So you can begin to see the efficiencies of using a layperson as your frontline healthcare worker in terms of how you use the time of the specialist. Uh, this is an example of health education field that were put up in the clinics to give information to people about uh, this new program. And this you can see is kind of, well, it's just a, essentially the creation of private space. One of the things we discovered during the development work was the, the, the great importance of creating a private space for people to be able to discuss their personal uh, difficulties. Um, uh, which was often not available in primary health centers because there was, uh, the, 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 there was no uh, structural room. Uh, there was no room available for private space. So we created private spaces for the counselors. We published our findings uh, last year. This is the first set of findings that were published in The Lancet. But what I really want to tell you is, that, is the overall findings over, very briefly, over the 12 months. What did we actually find uh, in terms of comparing these two arms? What were the benefits of the lay health worker-led intervention in the collaborative step care clinics compared to the, uh, the usual care clinics. So first of all, just to tell you, this was a fairly large trial involving over 2,500 people uh, with depression and anxiety, a large proportion of whom, more than 80%, uh, were actually reviewed uh, at three points in time, and you don't need to worry about that. And what we did was we carried out the analysis separately for the primary health centers in the public sector, and the primary health centers in the private sector. Now for you to understand the difference of the results, you need to understand also how healthcare is organized. In the public sector, healthcare is typically organized in an extremely impersonal way, which is to say, you do not necessarily see the same practitioner on each visit. The a, a, a clinic may have one or more practitioners, they may rotate. Typically, even if there's only one practitioner, that practitioner may not be in the clinic for more than a couple of years. The clinics typically have, uh, they're very crowded, and there is no privacy. So you, when you go to see the doctor in a private, in a, in a public clinic, the chances are the next person who's waiting behind you will actually be waiting right behind you. Uh, will be standing, actually, right behind you while you complete your consult, uh, and the doctor will write out whatever they have to write out. Typically, the doctor will be limited by uh, just giving pills. There will be no provision of any kind of interpersonal intervention. Uh, and, and so this is what is often called a collective care model. Uh, so this is large groups of people coming to clinics with a large group of practitioners, usually nurses and doctors, and, and there is no real sense of a rapport that is built, uh, and certainly no privacy. The private care model, of course, is quite different. The private care model involves seeing the same practitioner each time, over many, many years, you develop a relationship with that practitioner. Um, obviously, it's private, so it's, uh, it's, it's on a, uh, you, you, you see the person behind closed doors, and typically, you might have more time uh, to see that practitioner. So, as you can imagine, the effect of adding a lay counselor could potentially be quite different in these two contexts. 
So what do we find in the public sector? In the public sector, we found very substantial benefits of the agriculture. Um, how do you introduce a lay worker into the public sector context? So we, we recruited, the primary health center recruited them. Okay, they recruited them. Yeah, they recruited the LA health worker. Uh, we provided the training on the evidence-based strategies. I see. And then they're placed in the primary health center. Yeah. And it was the same with the, G, with the private sector. Private sector. Yeah. So in the primary health center, we found that the addition of a lay person in the clinic who provided this case management produced significant benefits on all the outcomes that we were concerned with. So for example, the recovery rates from depression and anxiety were much higher. Uh, there was a 30% reduction uh, uh, in the prevalence of these, of these conditions. Um, suicide attempts and plans is not just thinking about suicide, but actually attempting or planning suicide also showed uh, a 36% reduction. So a very large reduction. As you can see, there's a fairly low intensity intervention in many respects. Uh, and very importantly, I think from, a, from the perspective of impairment in everyday life, uh, the, the, the people in the in the, uh, uh, the lay health worker clinics uh, had much more days, um, much fewer days out of work, much fewer disability days uh, than people in the control arm clinics. So in other words, were, the intervention was able to produce not only improvements in mental health, but also have in, uh, improvements in uh, in disability days. Yeah. Can you clarify how many? What's the percentage you think actually seek treatment in the first place? Because this is really addressing those people that get into the clinics, but is there a percentage that you feel just will not seek treatment? Of course there is, yes, yes. There, there is a substantial proportion of people in the population who don't seek help. Uh, but obviously, these interventions are facility-based. And I think the, the sequence of my thinking is this, that first you need to establish what is a model of effective care within the facility. And once that is actually shown to be effective and in place, you then have community-based advocacy to encourage people with those symptoms to actually seek help. In the absence of something in place in the facility, it's not, it, 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 it wouldn't be very logical to get people to actually seek help. Uh, yeah. uh, to the extent that you, know, you were working for a year, if the demand side starts responding, knowing that now there is treatment available, this is only an underestimate of the, the actual effect then, right? Because you, you, might, you might actually foresee that a lot more people who should have or would have Sought treatment earlier, but didn't because of lack of supply side, because of the supply side constraint, are now coming into place. Yeah. So actually, the, the prevalence you see here, the effect you see, is the, pre the prevalence could be higher because right. more people will see. Absolutely. Right. In so fact, it's quite interesting. As we progress with the program, uh, many of the doctors in the health centers actually started telling us that people by word of mouth yeah. uh, had started talking to the neighbors and friends, and right. then there'd been a a, a, a greater number of people coming with with uh, coming mental health problems to the clinics. So we absolutely correct. Right. However, the impact in the, in the private GP sector was quite different. What do you think the result was? What did we, so I've, I've told you in the public sector, there was a substantial benefit, but that there was a different finding in the private sector. What do you think the finding in the private sector was? Take a guess, speculate. Sorry? There was no difference, yeah. In, in what sense was there no difference? There was no difference between the two arms. So what do you think was happening in the private sector? Were the private usual care GPs doing better than expected? Or was the addition of the lay counselor not doing as well as expected? How comparable are the populations well, so that's we'll come to the moment. We'll come, come in, uh, in a moment. We'll explore the reasons for the lack of difference. But what do you think the finding was? I think the addition of the lay council was not adding anything. That's correct. So the addition of the lay council wasn't adding anything because the private GPs were already doing an extremely good job. The recovery rates in the private GP sector were on par with those that we saw with the lay council and the government clinics. Now, what is the reason for that? What do you think about, you have to say, an unexpected finding? And in some respects, it teaches you a little bit about the great differences about the quality of healthcare that people may receive in different sectors. Uh, but what is it about the private sector do you think actually canceled out the effect of having a lay counselor? What do private practitioners in your, if you might have experienced yourself, uh, or you can speculate, what is it about the private sector engagement? that might actually be different. Yeah? 
could be just building the relationships with patients so you actually get a little more context to some of the issues. Yeah, absolutely. So the first very important thing is these were physicians who have known that individual and their families forever. Because this is the physician actually deals with the whole family. Uh, this is the family physician and therefore has a sense of context about the person's emotional difficulties in a way that no public sector doctor can because the public sector doctor is constantly moving and rotating uh, from one clinic to the other and does not develop any real knowledge of that individual. So that's a very important reason. What else? The private practitioner has an incentive to help Absolutely. There's a, there's a, the, and that's the for-profit incentive. Okay, so the private physician will do everything in order to ensure recovery, including proactively seeking to find out how the person is, uh, getting the person to return to the clinic, uh, because this is part of the for-profit model. Uh, and so the for-profit model encourages long-term case management to recovery, uh, and, and, and this is not something which you will see in the government-run public sector. So essentially what we can say is that contextual factors are very important determinants on how task shifting works. The best evidence we have right now would only suggest that task shifting works best in very busy public sector uh, clinics in which uh, there are great difficulties for the existing healthcare workers to establish the sorts of relationships, the rapport uh, and, the, and the working arrangements uh, that the private sector can, uh, can, can offer. So put it another way, the addition of a lay counselor in the government clinics help them achieve the same sorts of results as the private sector could achieve, which is another way in which you can interpret these results here. Yeah, when we look at the incentive side, uh, it also depends on how the entire thing is structured. Yeah. Like, uh, it may not surprise there is no difference, but the reasons could be two. One is that uh, it, they were already doing so well, so there was no difference. The other way of looking at it is, uh, the, the model doesn't provide any additional incentive to improve. Otherwise, this model should perhaps uh, improve even in a private uh, setup. doesn't make any difference. If this model is not uh, working in a private establishment, uh, not because they were doing extremely well, but this does not have any incentive to improve. Whatever True, they are. Uh, you're right. But in fact, they were doing very well because we actually have the recovery rates in the control arm and we can actually see how they were doing without the counselor. And we can see that without the counselor, they were achieving exactly the same recovery rates as the primary health center with the counselor. And the addition of a counselor also produced equal recovery rates. So you can actually see that the recovery rates are very high and those recovery rates are actually not dissimilar to what you will see in the West. Because remember, there is a ceiling effect to recovery for depression and anxiety. The treatments we have are not 100% recovery. Even if everybody with a depressive and anxiety disorder got the best treatments available, there will remain a group of people who would remain chronically ill because our treatments are not as effective as, as say, for example, the treatment of uh, certain infectious diseases. Um, so we were achieving very, very good recovery rates in, this, in the uh, GP sector, even without the lay counselor. So your question is, could the lay counselor have even further enhanced those recovery rates? Well, certainly the model was not able to. Certainly, the model was not able to go beyond that. Could that be because of the difference in population? I think somebody suggested that. Yeah, it could be. It could be. It would, in fact, there wasn't such a big difference. Uh, it could be. We did look at the social class. It's true that the private sector has slightly higher social class, but actually, private sector in India is not. It's not for rich people. In fact, in in in, in the private sector, eighty percent of India seeks private care. You know, and in fact, in some of the rural, poorest areas, private sector is also used. So it's more about access and availability as much as anything else. Of course, it costs uh, money as well, but, but, but it's accessed across the social classes. Sorry, can you just clarify one thing with the lay workers? So you, you're talking a lot about long-term care. So that suggests there, within the public sector, you're actually changing the information that's maintained about patients so that you know a certain, a certain treatment that they require and you follow up on that treatment over time. Did you introduce more record keeping or yes. more additional follow-up in addition to it? That's right. Well, that's another thing that we had in the, in the public sector, which the private sector already had. Yeah, yeah record keeping. You're absolutely right. So that's another kind of uh, you know, intervention. You can call it intervention. For us, it was just about good practice. Uh, so there were records that were maintained for each patient, uh, which otherwise are not maintained, actually, in the public sector, whereas in the private sector, actually, they do maintain records uh, for continuing care. Um, just a question on a few slides. 
lot of staff, but I was wondering how you measure um, suicide attempts slash completions that it's baseline. Suffering. It's oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. That's the only way you can. Yeah. Okay. It's the only way one can actually, um, you know, elicit that kind of information is by self report. Another methodology question. So, in terms of looking at recovery, did you just do a pre and post intervention with the GC12 survey? I, I, could you say that now? So, in terms of your in your methodology, yeah. did you measure the recovery? pre-GHC12 and a post-GHC12? That's correct. Although we didn't use the GHQ for recovery, we used a diagnostic But it, it was a similar kind of idea that you did a diagnostic interview at baseline uh -huh. and a diagnostic interview at there every review. It wasn't necessarily the yeah. same. Yeah. Sorry? Was it the same tool or a different tool? Same tool, same tool. And then, um, with regard, what was the mean interval time? Did you give everybody 12 months or That's right. for the... And then with your prevalence estimate, was the reduction of the problems estimate just based on what is the rates of screening and identifying the um, common? So you would assume that everybody has a disorder at baseline, because otherwise you wouldn't get, you're not eligible to receive care. So you start with 100%, and then you look at what the prevalence is at 2, 6, and 12 months, and you compare the two arms, and you look at the cumulative prevalence. And so what you then get is a result that says, cumulatively, there was a 30% reduction in the prevalence in the active or the intervention arm as compared to the control arm. Okay. Yeah, but everyone would have had a condition at baseline. That is your eligibility to actually enter into the program. Yeah. Um, for the baseline interview, was that performed by a training counselor or the, by the interview interest? for the outcome evaluation? Mm -hmm. Not by a counselor. No, the outcome evaluation was done by someone who had no idea which clinic the person was going to. So that's the idea of what we call masking or blinding. That is to say that to minimize the bias in the assessment, the person who's doing the outcome evaluation is not connected actually with the program at all. It's a separate, in fact, it's a separate organization. I haven't mentioned the organization structure, but there was an altogether separate organization that was only given addresses of people who had agreed to be part of the program and agreed for someone to visit them at home to do interviews. So they had no idea which clinics uh, that these patients went to. Yeah, that, that, that I just call masking, and the reason is otherwise, you know, there is a subjective bias that can creep in. If you know someone's getting a treatment, then you may subjectively give them a different set of scores um, than if you didn't know. Since this was a cluster randomized trial, did the private sector providers in the control clusters know that what was happening in the treatment? Area? Yes, you have to, yes. Because the very nature of consent is that everyone has to know exactly what's going on before they agree to take part. Well, I was just thinking, if I'm a private GP and you told me that I was doing this somewhere else, yeah. I would want to beef up my yeah. performance. Yeah, so no, absolutely. But also, I have to tell you, the other reason is that you're quite right, uh, Amor. And you know, the other thing is that the GPs were not randomly selected. Right. The, the health centers were. So the health centers were randomly selected from the whole state. And so they had no choice of whether they were in the program or not because permission to take part to, was done at the level of government. Mm -hmm. uh, so these were truly representative of the average health center. GPs are not organized in that way. Every GP is a private entrepreneur. Uh, and so you have to approach each GP individually and they have to agree to take part. And so from a thousand odd GPs that we approached, only 14 agreed to take part. So this is a highly non-representative sample of GPs, and it could well be this is a group of GPs who truly wanted to take a chance to improve care in their clinics, uh, and, and, and therefore already may have characteristics that are quite different from the other GP. The point is we never know the answer. This is a speculation. Uh, it's a post-doc speculation. When you get a result like this, you can only think about what the factors may be, but you know, these are all speculations. I'm aware that time is running out, so I'm just going to say the key message it showed show that there are substantial benefits in improving recovery rates, uh, uh, reducing suicide attempts and plans and disability days in people attending public, public uh, sector clinics. We can say nothing about the private sector uh, from the result. And uh, we, we've done an economic uh, calculation to show that really the additional cost of having this program integrated in the clinic uh, is, is, is not very large. And the important thing, of course, is the idea of a lay counselor is not so much about only one disorder, but it's actually a proof of concept. Um, so the idea really here is that by including a lay person in your primary health center to provide chronic disease care, you can, improve better, you can achieve better outcomes uh, uh, than, than, than not having that lay counselor. Uh, and the additional investment is not large. 
because obviously the same person, if there was such a person in the clinic, she would not only be delivering depression care, she would be effectively providing uh, 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 all the psychosocial interventions for a whole range of chronic conditions, not just depression. Okay, I just want to finish off by telling you about, I mentioned earlier that we run courses in India uh, to really try and disseminate the kind of work that we do uh, to larger audiences. Uh, so there are two courses that we run. We run an annual course on leadership and mental health, uh, which is a two-week course that really examines how uh, we can actually scale up interventions uh, for mental health problems using a task shifting model uh, in, in, in low resource settings. And the second course is a methodological course that really looks at how do we take complex healthcare interventions, which is pretty much any public health intervention is a complex one, any health systems intervention is a complex one, how do we actually go through the process of systematically developing such an intervention and then evaluating uh, its effectiveness. I think there's only a couple of minutes left, or maybe not even a couple. I'll stop there, and uh, if there is a couple of questions, then. Yeah, so one of the formative questions that we did was to actually ask about the gender because we had no idea would there be a difference in terms of acceptability of the gender of the counselor. Uh, and, and, and we found that as far as women were concerned, women respondents, they uniformly said they would prefer a woman. As far as men were concerned, it was evenly balanced. And obviously, we couldn't have a male and a female gender counselor for men and women, so we chose a woman uh, a counselor. Uh, then after the trial is over, we went back to people and uh, selected subgroup of people to ask them what the experiences were. And you know, quite interestingly, we found there were no no differences in the sense of um, acceptability for men, male respondents to have a female counselor. So all of the counselors were women, but then like the in the private. They were also women. They were all were all in the private providers controlled it. Were there no health people? Were they mostly men, male providers? Yes. In fact, I think they're wrong at the right. Yeah. But this is true actually of the gender divide in healthcare in India more and more. In fact, I think it's true also in most other developing countries. The physicians tend to often be men, mm -hmm. more often than not. And then as you go, as it were, further down the healthcare system into the community, the proportion of women keep increasing so that community health workers are by and large mostly women. Uh, and in India, the front line community health workers called ASHA, uh, it, it, it's, it's always a woman. Yeah. By definition, they, 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 that health worker is a woman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just uh, looking at uh, administrative or uh, government point of view, yes. uh, is this type of program sustainable? It is. In fact, the National uh, Community uh, Chronic Disease Program is exactly using this model. They're using uh, what they call, well, the ASHA is the best example of a community health volunteer. Um, so at scale, I think India is the one country where the use of lay people to deliver healthcare has reached proportions that I don't think has been done in any other part of the world. There's a huge, there's a huge recognition that somehow we have to look at different models of um, of addressing this human resource crisis. So the latest, uh, more recently, they were a new three-year uh, doctor's degree, as you know, a, a, a rural medical degree. So this is a new medical qualification for people to work only in villages and they will be medically qualified to deliver treatment for a specific batch of conditions. And the ASHA is another example of such a, such an uh, innovation. So I think there is. Uh, Even in specific area of mental health? Yeah, well the National Mental Health Program is being revised this year uh, and this is the sort of evidence we hope. Now of course there's no, no telling whether that's exactly what will happen but this is the only models that are available on the ground at the moment which are evidence based. Whether they will find their way I can't be sure, but certainly now that there is evidence, uh, certainly it's now up to us also to do very good advocacy to make sure that it finds its way into the program. Thank you so much, Vikram.